Chapter 5 Friends and Enemies Snape sat in the staff lounge for the weekly staff meeting on Saturday morning, barely listening to the chatter going on around him. He was thinking about the conversation he had the day before. After Salazar had left the classroom, it had only taken him thirty minutes to come to a decision. He would indeed help the founder of his house. Snape felt it was a great honor to be asked, and when Salazar showed up for his detention that afternoon, he would let him know of his decision. He was snapped out of his thoughts when the topic turned to the boy in question. How has young Harry been this week? Dumbledore asked with a smile, and his customary twinkling eyes. Snape raised an eyebrow and sneered at the headmaster. He hadn't been able to talk with Salazar, but Snape thought it best to pretend that things hadn't changed. He's a natural in Transfiguration Albus. He was able to turn a match into a needle in the first class. Professor McGonagall said with a smile. In her ability he seems fine, he mentioned to me that he tended his aunt's garden and kept it up. He seems very interested in the difference between magical and non-magical plants. Though I did have to ask his pet snake not to jump out of the plants and scare the other students. They share the class with my Hufflepuffs, but the snake was only targeting the Slytherins for some reason. Sprout said with a chuckle. It was actually quite amusing to see. Snape raised another eyebrow in amusement, but held back a snicker. No doubt a prank. He spat. Just like his father. How has Harry adjusted to Slytherin House? Dumbledore asked. Snape sighed in annoyance. He is shunned by the entire house. They seem to be afraid of him because of his ability to speak parcel tongue. I heard whispers that he is the next Dark Lord and other such nonsense. He can often be found by one of the windows with that snake wrapped around his shoulders, doing homework or sitting lost in thought. He seems to be a loner with no friends. Dumbledore frowned. Can you do something to encourage the boys of his year to interact with him? I doubt it headmaster. Malfoy, Crab, Goyle, and not are not likely to be dot friendly dot towards him, if you get my meaning. Zarbini on the other hand might be promising, but he mostly sticks to Malfoy. However, in potions yesterday he seemed to be friendly with two Gryffindors. A Melbourne female by the name of Granger, and the Longbottom boy. Yes, they do seem friendly with Mr. Potter. McGonagall said. I have observed them in the library together. He seems to help Mr. Longbottom a great deal with his studies. Is that so? Dumbledore asked curiously, and she nodded. Are they afraid of his ability to speak Parseltong? Not that I've noticed. Mr. Longbottom seems okay with it, and with Miss Granger being a Mulborn, I don't think she understands how that is really perceived. She answered. They seem to like the snake, and I have observed both Mr. Longbottom and Miss Granger petting it. Is it okay for him to have that snake Albus? Should we discourage its presence? Flitwick asked. It hasn't caused any trouble to my knowledge. In my class. It sits on the desk in front of Mr. Potter and observes the other students. I do find him talking to it quite a bit, but in charms, he's at the top of the class. He got the levitating charm right away. It only took him three tries. He also helps the other students, once he has completed the task. It's the same for my class, several other professors said in unison. No. In truth snakes are an authorized pet. Salazar Slytherin himself made it so. It's just in the last sixty years or so we have discouraged them. We only say they are allowed now, cat, or toad because snakes are looked upon unfavorably. Especially since Voldemort. He answered, and ignored the flinch that everyone displayed at the mention of the name. As long as little Nora doesn't cause any problems she is free to stay. Snape scoffed. So he gets special treatment because he's a potter. I I I find I it odd that the boy who deaf defeated why why you know who I is able to talk to SS snakes. Professor Quirrell said. Should we watch him in CC case he is a dark AWW wizard? Dumbledore frowned at the stuttering man. No, I do not think Harry is a dark wizard. However, 
I do think he needs to be watched. Severus, as his head of house, I want you to keep an eye on him. Pay attention to what he reads and who he speaks to. Also, try to get some of the more neutral and lighter Slytherins to interact with him. Snape sighed loudly. Of course headmaster. He said, shaking his head. Dumbledore smiled at him. Thank you. Albus, what of the boy's home life? Several of us have overheard him say that he was mistreated at his mill relatives. From what I understand, they worked him like a house elf and they abused him both physically and verbally. Madame Pomfrey said. I want to check him. That won't be necessary Poppy, Dumbledore said, putting up her hand. I realize Harry is small for his age, and I too have heard him speak of his home life, but I think it is a simple misunderstanding. Children often claim abuse when there is none. Their minds work on a different level than ours. I believe he is fine. The muddy witch huffed, but remained silent. Snape raised an eyebrow, but he too kept quiet. However, McGonagall spoke up. Albus, you heard me say that they were the worst sort of mulls. I know Minerva, but I had a talk with the Dursleys and they assured me that they didn't go too far with discipline. They are his family after all, and they have agreed to allow him to stay with them next summer, despite his disappearing act. Very well. McGonagall said in an unsure tone as she sighed. Now, I have one last thing. Severus, it has come to my attention that you gave Harry detention because of Nora. Is there a chance that I can talk you out of that? Dumbledore asked. No. He said sharply. Regardless of my new knowledge that snakes are authorized, I will still have him serve detention. His letter said owl, cat, or a toad, not a snake. He will receive no special treatment from me. He sneered. Dumbledore sighed with disappointment. I see. Very well then. I thank you all for being here this morning. Have a good weekend. After breakfast that same morning, Salazar decided to spend some time outside in the warm sunshine. He was sitting beside the lake, and Nora was playing around in the shallow water. He had his homework for the week spread out in front of him, but looked up when he heard footsteps approaching. Stay away from Hermione and Neville you stupid Slytherin snake. The red-haired boy said, trying his best to look menacing. Salazar raised an eyebrow. I'm sorry but I don't think we have met yet. What is your name? The redhead was caught off guard by the lack of acknowledgement to his threat. I'm Dot Ron Weasley. Hello Ron. I'm Harry Potter. It's nice to meet you, Salazar said, and grinned at Ron's obvious confusion. Ron narrowed his eyes and glared at Salazar. Don't think I'm fooled by your niceness for one bloody second. I know you're evil. Anyone that can talk to snakes is evil. You stay away from Hermione and Neville. Speaker? Is that carrot bothering you? Yes Nora, but you have to understand, he is young and confused. He doesn't know any better. Everything is fine. Okay then. I will go back to playing in the water. It's quite refreshing you know, she said, and slithered back to the shallow water. See. Evil. Ron hissed. Salazar rolled his eyes. What makes you think I'm evil? Besides the whole talking to snakes thing. You're a dark wizard. Everyone says so. You dot you dot are a Slytherin. So talking to snakes and being a Slytherin makes me a dark wizard? Yes. Ron shouted. You want to corrupt Neville and Hermione. Yes that's it. You want to corrupt them and make them dark wizards too. Why would I want to do that? Salazar asked in a slightly amused tone. Ron looked at a loss for words, but glared at Salazar. Because you're evil, and anyway, your plan won't work. They are Gryffindors, Ron said smugly, as if that was the final word on the matter. So let me get this right. I'm an evil dark wizard because I'm a Slytherin and talk to snakes. I want to corrupt two Gryffindors and turn them into evil dark wizards too. Yes. He said, though he sounded unsure now. So why Gryffindors and not another Slytherin who would be more open to the idea? 
Ron wavered for a moment, but then sighed. I don't know. He mumbled. Salazar chuckled. Truth is Ron, I never knew I was a wizard until I got my letter. I'm no more evil than you are. Hermione is my friend because we have something in common. We were both raised in the Mull world and can talk about things we know about from that world. My mother was a Mull born too, yet that seems to be something that most people forget. My father was a Pulard who fought against you know who. Neville is a Pulard whose family also fought against you know who. They are the only ones who don't run away from the sight of me. They are the only two who have been friendly. Ron scowled at him. Well just know that I will be watching you very closely. He said, then turned and stomped away. That was interesting speaker. You dealt with the carrot dot 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 differently. Nora said, as she slithered back toward him. Yes well, to deal with a gryfind or often takes an extreme amount of patience. I am surprised you didn't offer to bite him though. Salazar said, looking at her with amusement. I don't eat vegetables. Nora answered, stretching out in the grass beside him. Salazar burst out laughing. Indeed you don't. A few hours later, Salazar was sitting in the great hall eating lunch when an owl fluttered down beside him. Looking up in surprise, he took the letter from the owl's leg and read it. My old friend. I have spoken to my other friend about the multiple problems that you mentioned. He admitted that the thought had not crossed his mind, but said that he would look into it. I asked about the location of our mutual enemy, and he assures me that he is fully aware of where he is, but refuses to tell me. I also asked about my property, but he refuses to tell me the measures in which he has taken in order to assure its safety. He said it was for my own protection. I don't know what to make of all this, and I already know what your reaction is. It is one thing for you to refuse me information about the whereabouts of other people for mine and their safety, but it is entirely another thing when it involves my own property. I can tell you that something seems off to me. Please find my property my friend, and put it in the safe place. Your old friend. Me. Salazar reread the letter from Nicholas, and immediately shook his head. He didn't know what Albus was playing at by refusing to let Nicholas know about the security measures for the stone, but it didn't set well with Salazar. He looked at Nicholas's plain brown barn owl and sighed. Give me a minute to write a reply. The owl hooted in acknowledgement, and settled down beside him. My old friend. I agree something is not right and I cannot imagine why you would be refused such important information. However, I have recently been proven wrong about a certain person who I thought was no good. This person might be able to give us the answers we seek. I do not know for sure if this person is willing to work with us yet, but I have had them swear an oath to not speak about our secrets. I questioned this person rather vigorously with Veritaserum and I am thoroughly convinced about their loyalty so there is no reason for concern. If this person agrees to help us, I will most certainly pass on any information I can gather. Your old friend. Me. Salazar rolled up the piece of parchment, sealed it, tied it to the owl's leg, and watched it fly off. He sat there pondering over why Albus would not be forthcoming with this very important knowledge, but he could not understand the logic or come up with any sensible conclusions. He was still sitting there trying to make sense of it all when he was interrupted by two very excited Gryffindors. Harry, Harry. Hermione breathed in a frantic whisper, as she and Neville plopped down beside him at the Slytherin table. We have got something to tell you. Neville took a deep breath, leaned over towards him, and whispered quietly. We were in the common room when Fred and George Weasley came in looking really frightened about something. Their friend Lee was sitting near us, and we overheard them talking about the third floor. They unlocked the door because they wanted to know what the pain of death part of Dumbledore's warning meant, and they came face to face with a vicious three-headed dog. He finished frantically. Salazar felt his blood run cold as he stared at the two frightened children. Have you told anyone else about this? N no. Hermione said. We told you because we wanted to warn you, 
but if this gets out, other students might want to see it and get hurt. That is very good thinking Hermione, and I agree. This needs to stay a secret. Were the Weasleys hurt at all? Neville shook his head. No we don't think so. They just looked really scared. Salazar felt himself relax a bit. Okay, do not tell anyone else about the dog. He whispered. We won't. They said in unison. Salazar nodded and refrained the urge to hex the idiot headmaster, who had just entered the Great Hall, and tell the man that locking up a Cerberus inside a school full of children was the dumbest thing in the world. Instead, he sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. He didn't know what to think about all this, but he needed to get his thoughts together on the matter. Suddenly, Hermione let out a shriek, and Salazar looked up to see that someone had dropped a pitcher full of pumpkin juice over her head. She sat the dripping wet, with a look of shock on her face. He glanced down the table and saw that Draco, Crab, and Goyle were sitting a few seats away and were laughing. Sorry Granger. Malfoy said in a tone that implied otherwise. We were practicing the levitating charm. We must have messed something up. He laughed. Neville jumped up with his wand in his hand. It doesn't sound like you are all that sorry Malfoy. He accused. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. the squib has guts. Malfoy sneered. You two need to go back to the Gryffindor table where you belong. We don't like your kind. Salazar calmly flicked his wand at a bowl of chips, a plate of sandwiches, and a pitcher of milk, and sent them flying at the three pompous clowns. The milk hit Draco square in the head, which made it splash all over him. The chips flew into Crab's face, and the sandwiches flew apart and sprayed their ingredients all over Goyle's robes. Sorry about that. Salazar shrugged, as a few Hufflepuffs began laughing from their table. I was practicing the banishing charm that I read about, and something must have gone wrong. Draco jumped up from his seat, and drew his wand. Salazar also jumped up, along with Neville and a still soaking wet Hermione. Despite his small size, Salazar shoved them behind himself in order to shield them as best as he could, and glared at Draco. Draco however, decided he didn't like being on the business end of Salazar's wand so instead he clenched his fists. Potter. You wait until I tell my father about this, he shouted, wiping milk off of his face. Then he turned around with crab and gall in tow, and began stomping out of the great hall. You tell your father Malfoy, Salazar shouted after him. You tell him, and warn him that if he has the nerve to come after me, that I will tie his slimy ass up into a blasted pretzel. Draco wheeled around to face him. Don't threaten my father Potter. I'll make you pay. Don't threaten me with your father. Learn to fight your own battles without involving dear old daddy you bloody coward. This last comment sent Draco into a fit of rage. Petrificus totless. The blonde screamed. Protego. Salazar cried, throwing up shield charm that was large enough to protect himself. Hermione and Neville. The full body bind curse bounced off the shield and flew back towards Draco. The blonde stood rooted to the spot in shock, and his own curse hit him right in the chest. Draco's whole body seized up and he fell over with a loud thump. How did that work out for you Malfoy? A third year Slytherin exclaimed, and most of the great halls started laughing. Crab and Gold drew their own wands, but Salazar lazily summoned them along with Malfoy's. He calmly grabbed them as they sailed toward him and placed them in front of a strangely amused looking Donald door. Then he turned to face the three boys. I'm sure if you ask Professor Dumbledore very nicely for your wands, he will give them back to you. He said loudly. Then he turned his full attention to Hermione and Neville. Are you two okay? He asked with concern. Neville nodded but Hermione shook her head. No, I'm covered in pumpkin juice, she said, looking at him with tears in her eyes. I feel dot gross. Do you want me to teach you a new spell? Salazar asked gently. Her eyes brightened up a bit, and she nodded. Okay, 
This one is a cleaning spell that I read about, and the incantation is Tergio. What it does is siphon liquids off of something, or in this case, someone. Are you ready? They nodded, and began practicing the spell. Hermione was able to get it after a few tries, but Neville took a little longer. They were standing in front of the head table, and Salazar noticed that Flitwick, Sprout, and McGonagall were smiling in their direction. Dumbledore was strangely beaming with pride, but Quirrell seemed to be studying him in an odd sort of way. The way Quirrell was looking at him made Salazar's scar sting. Thank you Harry. Hermione said after they were finished. I've never had friends as nice as you and Neville. I'm used to being picked on, but no one has ever stood up for me before. Neville blushed, but Salazar smiled at her. I've been there Hermione. I know how it feels. It's okay. Will you also show us that thing you did to make Malfoy's curse bounce back at him? Neville asked hopefully. Salazar laughed. It called a shield charm, and yes, I will. They grinned at him, and then started laughing at the memory of Malfoy falling over. I have detention with Professor Snape though, so I better get going. May I suggest that you two go back to Gryffindor Tower? I know you must still feel sticky Hermione, and would like to freshen up. Yes Harry, you are right. She said with a giggle. I will walk with you. Neville offered, and Hermione giggled again as they caught sight of a seventh year Slytherin finally cancelling the curse on Malfoy. When he stood up, he glared at them, but fled the room as people pointed and laughed. Should I go with them speaker? Nora asked, as she glared at Draco's retreating form from Salazar's pocket. He took her out, placed her on the head table, and looked at her curiously. Why? To make sure they get there safely of course. I am deadly you know. He chuckled, and turned to his friends. She wants to know if she can go with you. To make sure you get there safely. Hermione and Neville grinned, and Neville held out his hand. Nora happily slithered into his robe sleeve, and poked her head out. I'll keep a watch out for Puny. He won't get past me. Salazar shook his head and laughed. I have no doubts about that my friend. Then he repeated what Nora said. I'd better get going though. I'll see you all at dinner. They nodded, and Salazar began making his way to the dungeons. As Salazar neared Snape's office, he noticed that the door was slightly ajar and that there was a loud voice coming from the room. He double-checked the corridor, and quickly used the disillusionment charm to make himself invisible. He crept over to the door, peeked in, and almost laughed out loud at the sight. Draco was ranting to Snape, who was calmly sitting at his desk and listening. Salazar carefully opened the door a bit farther and slipped in. He noticed that Snape caught the slight movement, but the young potions master didn't acknowledge it. He silently sat down in a chair in one of the dark corners, and briefly lit the tip of his wand to let Snape know where he was. When Snape slightly nodded his head, Salazar knew that Snape knew exactly who it was that came in. And he humiliated me. Draco cried, as he stomped back and forth in front of Snape's desk. Wait until my father hears about this. Where did Potter put your ones? He gave them to that mull-loving fool Dumbledore. Draco spat. Then his voice softened, and he looked at Snape. Can you get them back for us? He asked hopefully. Snape shook his head. I'm afraid I cannot. The headmaster will tell me no. You will have to do it yourself. Stupid Potter. Draco said with a scowl. He will pay for this. Might I suggest you tread carefully where Potter is concerned? Snape asked. Are you siding with him? Draco asked in a deadly tone. Don't be daft you stupid boy. Snape snapped. I am saying to tread carefully because, in case you have forgotten, he defeated one of the darkest and most powerful wizards of our time as a fifteen-month-old baby. I know for a fact that he was raised by Muzz and didn't know he was a wizard until a month ago. If he can pull off the spells that you say he has performed just by reading about them, then he is extremely powerful. Most seventh years can't pull them off, so tread carefully Draco. He warned. 
Draco scowled at him. Fine. He spat. Come on you two, let's go get our ones. He said, and Crab and Goyle loyally followed him out of the room. When the door had shut, rather forcefully, behind the boys, Salazar shook his head and laughed. I applaud your ability to cunningly use words that say, mess with Potter at your own risk. Thank you sir, Snape said with a slight smile. Draco is a child, so I won't hurt him, Salazar said, as he cancelled the charm on himself. But I will defend myself and those in my company from blatant bullying. I wish I could say that I can put a stop to it, but I can't. I know. You've been playing the role of a double spy most of your adult life. If you suddenly appeared on the light side you'd lose the respect and confidence of those in the house, and they would never tell you anything. That is true, Snape said with a sigh. Having been a professor at this very school, once upon a time, I know how hard it is to keep children in line. Yet at the same time, letting them make their own mistakes. They won't learn if you coddle them all the time. Trust me, Salazar said. Snape nodded in understanding. I have thought about your proposal, and I will indeed help you. However, I think I should remain a spy. One day all children in Slytherin may need me, and my help. Thank you. I was hoping that you would agree to help, but if you wish to remain a spy, that is your choice. I agree though, the children are our most important priority. However, Slytherin House is not the only house that needs to be protected. Please don't forget that Severus. Snape nodded. I do tend to forget that. I must admit, I do favor Slytherin more than the others. As do I, Salazar said with a smile. I suppose I should get on with my detention though. It would not look right if someone came in and saw us simply having a chat. I normally have the students scrub cauldrons without magic, but for the Slytherins I have them write lines. I am unsure of which one you'd prefer. I'll scrub the cauldrons. That way we can talk. I received a letter from Nicholas today, Salazar said, reaching into his bag. And what he had to say honestly leaves me baffled. I was hoping you knew anything about the topics that have been mentioned, Salazar said, handing the letter to the young man. As Snape read through the letter, Salazar began to scrub the cauldrons. A few minutes passed in silence, but then Snape sighed loudly. If he knows the current whereabouts of the Dark Lord, then that is news to me. Unless he is speaking about Albania. That was the last place we knew of. However, we know that the Dark Lord knows the new location of the stone, obviously, so I'm assuming that Albus knows where he is now. As for the Horcruxes, he has not mentioned them to me yet, but I will let you know if he does. Now, about the stone. I know he has set up a number of different traps under the trapdoor that resides on the third floor. I don't know exactly what they all are, but I know he has involved several of the professors, including myself. Really? Do you know who is responsible for the Cerberus? Snape stared at Salazar. Cerberus? he gasped. Yes, Salazar said with a frown. Apparently a few curious students decided to venture to the third floor to find out what the pain of death would be and came face to face with the beast. I was told this today at lunch. Thankfully Neville and Hermione told only me, but I told them to remain quiet about it. Hopefully no more children become curious. I knew, I knew when that bloody Gryffindor mentioned that at the feast, that that was where the stone was, and I knew that some child would get curious. You don't say things like that unless you want a child to find it. It should not have even been hinted at, Salazar ranted. Snape nodded his head in agreement, but then rolled his eyes. Let me guess, the Weasley twins discovered it. Salazar laughed and nodded. Yes. What concerns me though? is the fact that two third years were able to easily access the third floor. The Cerberus would be Hagrid's doing. I know he is one of the people protecting the stone. The door to the third floor is locked though. Just locked, Salazar cried. What the hell is Albus thinking? A simple unlocking charm can cause it to open. 
A first year could do that. Salazar sat down in a nearby chair, sighed, and pinched the bridge of his nose. There are other reasons why I don't trust Dumbledore, but this, this is just dot mind blowing. If I may, who are the other professors protecting the stone? Myself, Hagrid, Pomona, Minerva, Phileas, Quirrell, and Albus himself. Quirrell? Salazar asked curiously. Snape nodded. Yes sir, why are you surprised? He is the defense professor. What do you know about him? Well, he was the Mull Studies teacher for the longest time, but when Albus couldn't find a professor this year, Quirrell volunteered for it. I must admit that I ask every year for the position, but Albus never grants my request. He is afraid that I will revert to my old ways. Would you? Not to the extent that I was, but he still refuses, Snape said bitterly. Well whether you would, or would not, is really beside the point. There is something dot hot dot about Quirrell though. Every time he looks at me, the horcrux in my head hurts, Salazar said, tapping his scar. I haven't worked out what that means yet, but it is very odd. It hurts? What could that mean? Do you think Quirrell is a lower-ranking death eater that I was unaware of? Do you think the dark mark causes it? It had crossed my mind, but no, I don't think that's the cause. I can look at and converse with you and not have any pain, but he is different. Salazar sat lost in thought for a few minutes, and Snape watched him in silence. As Salazar processed everything that Snape had told him, one nagging thing kept coming to the forefront of his mind. Finally, he turned to Snape. What is Albus's plan for Harry Potter? Over the summer, Nicholas mentioned to me that Albus has taken a direct interest in my life. Do you know anything? Snape sighed and nodded. Yes, and it deals with that bloody prophecy. He wants to keep you safe and, to some extent, control you. Just this morning at our staff meeting he was asking about you, but he has never done that with any other student. He asked how you were doing in your classes, and I must admit you have gotten on all of the professor's good sides. He said with a smile. Then he asked how you were getting along with those in Slytherin, so I told him. He wants me to get some of the lighter and more neutral students to befriend you. He is pleased with your friendliness with Granger and Longbottom though. Salazar smiled fondly at the mention of Neville and Hermione. They are a bright spot in my day. Neville is a very shy boy, but I think he's coming out of his shell little by little. He is not incompetent, but he does have trouble using his magic, and I plan to figure out why. Hermione is a very bright little girl, and honestly, I find talking to her to be quite enjoyable really. Her brain is amazing for one as young as her. Sometimes I find myself almost calling the Rowena on occasion. I wonder why the child didn't end up in Ravenclaw, he muttered thoughtfully, but then shook himself out of his musings. As for Dumbledore, I'm not surprised. His motto has always been dot his way or no way. He tried to control the Potters because of the prophecy, and he do doubt will try to control me, he said with a sigh. He will find it difficult to do so though he said with a mischievous grin. Snape chuckled lightly. That will certainly be entertaining to watch. Even more fun to play. Salazar laughed. However, I did send a letter back to Nicholas informing him that I have brought you in. I didn't mention you by name, but he will know who I'm talking about. We need to keep as many people in the dark as we can though. Snape nodded in agreement. I do want to discuss something else with you sir. He said reluctantly, but Salazar nodded for him to continue. Before you came here, I had a preconceived idea about how you would be. I am ashamed to say that it was an unfavorable idea. I find myself at a loss on what to do, and wonder how you feel I should act towards you. Everyone believes that I think you are spoiled, arrogant, pampered, and act just like James Potter. Salazar smiled and chuckled. James and Lily both warned me that you may think like that, and given your attitude the first week, I figured that's what it was. I also want to tell you that I had an unfavorable view about you as well, but I am happy that I was proven wrong. 
However, I think we should continue to act like we dislike each other, more so you, than me. If those in Slytherin see you treating me in a favorable manner, your life may be in danger. On top of that, if they see you treating me with contempt they are more likely to run off at the mouth and give us useful information. Besides, it should be fun for you. The corners of Snape's mouth quirked up in a smile. Indeed. He chuckled. However, if for any reason I anger or offend you with any of my comments or actions, please let me know. Salazar nodded his head slightly and smiled. I will indeed let you know. For the rest of his detention, Salazar scrubbed the cauldrons, and him and Snape talked. Salazar learned a few surprising pleasant things, but he also learned some horrifying truths. Well that's the ending of that chapter, I do hope you enjoy this video if you like to see more remember, to hit that like button subscribe to this channel and leave a comment down below until next time.